namo tassa bhagavato harahato samma sambodasa namo tassa bhagavato harahato samma sambodasa namo tassa bhagavato harahato samma sambodasa homage to the buddha the blessed noble and fully self-awakened one. Uh, so I've chosen uh, this topic of love and relationship. Well, as you know, uh, huge, huge amounts of literature are written on love from philosophers, psychotherapists, self-helpers, all religions. <laughs> so I don't think I'll be covering everything. But I just want to mention one of, you know, a, a few of the essentials, really. So this is just love in general. It's not specific. I'm not going to talk about um, parental love or falling in love, all that sort of stuff. So I think the first thing that always um, I find important is just this sense of care. Now, you know, love is a little bit abused the word love itself but it's just understanding that interconnectedness we have and it's funny that um, you know with covid and all that a lot of people rediscovered neighborliness and i think this is uh, really part of this neoliberal thing you know the most people think of neoliberalism as a operating system an economic operating system based on the market but actually, it's an ideology, you know. It's, it's, on, it's on the understanding that everything moves. If everybody can just be an entrepreneurial individual, and what it does is it, it excites my greed to get things and have experience to get lots of money. And by doing that, of course, I, I see you as a competitor. So this is, this is the system we're in. We're in a system that, you know, supports greed, and um, competitiveness, you know, it's not, not about coordination, or about interconnectedness. And I think this manifests clearly now with this COVID, uh, because, you know, uh, the rich countries, uh, just like individuals, are just looking after themselves and to hell with everybody else. But unfortunately, <laughs> the interconnectedness is biting back. And, uh, and I'm hoping that it has some effect on on the actual system that we're we're under at the moment but uh just that sense of caring for somebody you know i'm not talking about uh, people who are sick or need help but just a, a general attitude of of uh looking after people being aware of their of their needs no matter what it is you know caring for them i think that's a really sort of important part of that of that whole syndrome that we call love. And if we don't do that, if we don't have that sort of attitude, then uh, I think we can shade off into controlling people, using them, you know? Well, I mean, abuse is at the far end, but you can also just use people, you know, just for your own benefit. Um, <clears throat> a sort of a presumption that they will help you, but you don't have to help them. So I think that um, that sort of really uh, undermines a relationship when 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 a person finds that they've been used. You know, I think the other thing is a sort of kindness expressed through a certain affection. Uh, you know, we have we manifest that with hugging and holding hands and hand on heart, you know, tone of voice, all that sort of stuff. I mean, the danger is it sort of becomes a, a bit more a bit sentimental, you know, huggy-wuggy, touchy-feely stuff. But, but I think it's important that there's a sort of expression of affection. And uh, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, when, when I remember acts of unkindness, that I've uh, committed, uh, there's always a, a sort of a bitter sorrow that goes with it, you know. How, how could I have behaved like that, you know? 
And all that really just depends on this sense of being kind. It's a lovely word, kind. And uh, when we put these two together and we, we wonder about how to live with other people, you know, sharing spaces, whether it's intimate or, or just in an office, doesn't really matter. And uh, there's this occasion in the scriptures where the Buddha comes across three, three arahats living together. Uh, the, I think their name, I was trying to find it, I just couldn't find the, the passage, but the, I think they're called the Anarudas after the chief monk who was with them. And he asked them, how do they live so peacefully together? And uh, he says, well, when I get up in the morning, I say to myself, what if I put aside what I want to do and do what the others want to do? And of course, if everybody says that, then you have this wonderful harmony. But if you're the only one who's saying it, then you'll probably get used. <laughs> so it's a case of, uh, you know, if you're with somebody, it doesn't matter where it is, as I say, the office or an intimate, just to get that, that feeling in the group that you're prepared to put aside what you want to do um, for what somebody else wants to do if it's, if it's more beneficial. I mean, it could even happen sort of on holiday, you know, where you've decided to go here and somebody else has decided to go there. And there's a, a big rumpus over which one to do, you know. But, but that doesn't necessarily have to happen if, if people have the attitude of putting aside what they want. In other words, you know, not being attached to what one wants to do. It's a lovely attitude. But I think underpinning uh, all relationship, actually, are these two qualities of gratitude and forgiveness. Um, I mean, if you're, you know, if we develop this constant sten uh, sense of, of gratitude, of being in debt, of wanting to um, manifest how much we appreciate what's been given to us, I mean, there's always that that desire to you know to, to help to communicate to be with some to be with somebody in in that sort of grateful way and uh you can't you can't have a relationship which at some point isn't going to hurt you know they're going to say something or do something which is going to upset upset you and if you can't let go of that if that sort of grudge stays within us a sense of resentment uh then that really undermines the relationship. It comes out just in the way we, we speak and in how we ask them to do things. It, it sort of, it's there within our communication. Um, and I think that's really important. And I would have thought that most relationships begin to collapse when one or the other side, you know, just holds on to these grudges, these resentments. I remember somebody telling me who was a, a a lawyer for family cases and um they, they uh, there was a divorce it was quite bitter and he kept saying to the husband there's no point in going court to court for this because you will lose <laughs> it'll be a complete waste of time for you to go to court and and and, and get all this out in court because you will lose the case you know so he tried to get it across them but he wanted to go to court he wanted somewhere where he could, you know, uh, explain <laughs> all over the place. And that's, uh, that's the, the sort of anger and the bitterness that can come with holding on to resentments. Just, you know, um, there's a lovely, uh, I read something quite lovely about this journalist. She'd gone down um, in America. She'd gone down to see how dolphins are trained. And what she saw was that, uh, whenever a dolphin didn't jump through the hoop or, or, or play the trick or failed to do the trick, nothing was said, absolutely nothing. And, uh, and, and then they, they sort of did the usual routine and the dolphin would complete the trick. When the dolphin completed the trick, the trainers jumped up and down with great joy, shouting and whooping and making all sorts of great noises. <laughs> so... Uh, she thought, well, I wonder, if this, I wonder if this would work on my husband. So <laughs> when she went back home, she never criticized him. She never said anything. But every time he did something that pleased her or, the, or he did something the way she wanted him to do, uh, she would jump up and down with great joy 
and blow trumpets. <laughs> and, uh, and he changed completely without knowing it. it you know, the, it was very harmonious. And then, of course, he went and told her. Uh, she went and told him. And so uh, he found that also worked, even if it's a consciousness, even if it's a conscious thing, that the other person knows what you're doing, it actually works. So this, so holding back on criticisms and all that sort of stuff, and really rejoicing when the person does something which is uh, to your benefit, uh, seems to have seems to be the trick really of getting people to <laughs> to do what you want them to do. <laughs> and the final thing um, is, of course, our spiritual well-being. I mean, obviously, if, you, if you're living with somebody who's on your path, then uh, that's, that's a tremendous sort of boost, isn't it? I mean, I've known people who've taken to the Buddhist path, but their partner really just doesn't like it. The spouse doesn't like it. And it's been a point of contention. But if you happen to be living with somebody who's, who's actually practicing with you, it's obviously a massive support, you know. And it's the same with any friendship that does it. Um, and just to sort of end with this lovely quote from the Buddha. So he's uh, Ananda, who was with him for the last 20 years of his life as a personal assistant. Um, he always thinks he knows a bit more than he actually does. And on this occasion, he said to the Buddha, Bhagavan, this is half the spiritual life, good friendship, good companionship, and good comradeship. And the Buddha says, oh, not so, Ananda, not so. This is the entire spiritual life. That is good friendship, good companionship, and good comradeship. For when someone has a good friend, a good companion, and a good comrade, it is to be expected they will develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path. So that was his um, uh, understanding of what friendship was, you know, a good friendship. And of course, if we remember, he was with uh, his five friends when, uh, you know, he, he, he left them. Uh, they all thought he'd gone soft, remember. He was practicing this um, ascetic um, asceticism, which was basically not eating, letting go of the body, you know. And uh, he, he was with five friends, five close friends who were all practicing together. And we all know that, uh, you know, practicing with people in a group is, is so much more encouraging than, than uh, doing it by yourself. So um, all these points, I mean, there's, there's a lot more, of course, I'm sure that you could think of it, or think of them, but um, just, you know, bringing to mind that sense of care, affection and kindness, especially kindness. I don't know, it's a big thing with me, that. These uh, underlying attitudes of gratitude and, for and forgiveness. Uh, and then finally, uh, just that uh, ability to be with somebody without um, open to their ideas, to their understandings, even in conversation, even in conversation. What if I put aside my ideas, you know, my views, my opinions, and open up to what the other one has to say? So often we, we don't like to do that because they might change our minds. <laughs> so it's a case of, um, you know, looking at this, at our relationships from this point of view of being with another human being who's like us. So I'm a human being and you're a human being and just remembering that. And that I think produces for us that sort of relationship of, of, uh, of kindness and care. Very good. So I can only hope my words have been of some assistance that I have not caused any confusion and that you will, by your practice of loving kindness, uh, be fully liberated sooner rather than later. <laughs>